Thank you very much for having me, Julia, for this very nice presentation. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'll try to restrict my, my presentation to, to 15 minutes. Uh, it's going to be about digital technologies and, and models of democracy, but also on the tensions. On I will mention a trilemma and some trade-offs that, uh, that you need to take into account when when uh, considering the role of digital technologies uh, for, for democracy, and democracy and democratization processes. So, yeah. Yeah, next. Uh, and I'll start with, I, I just introduced uh, some, some, some different slides that the ones that I initially thought to, to, to reflect on, on, uh, on a very timely example, which is the situation in Catalonia, right? I'm, f I'm from Barcelona, even though I've been here in Melbourne for nearly five years now, but I've been uh, observing what the developments in Catalonia for the last few years. This is a, uh, one of the rallies, uh, probably the one in 2013-14, I'm not sure. Uh, the first massive rallies, nearly one million people rallies in Barcelona started in 2010. If you look at the first pictures, they were rather chaotic or as any other rally in the world. Yes, a banner in the front and then people uh, behind the banners and, and uh, singing slogans and so on. But as, as those rallies went and on and on every year on the National Day, as you can see, they became much more sophisticated in organization. So by, by 2014, you needed to sign up to, to, to know your place in the, in the rally, uh, which, which color you would be wearing. Uh, there's lots of, of organization here to have a one million people rally. Uh, and, and that's also possible because of technology, because people were organizing uh, grassroots or... Sometimes it <laughs> okay, happens. grassroots organizations were organized uh, through social media and, and other media tools to, to organize. Um, so in a way, it's, it's both a, 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 what, what I would call a blended activism here or going on. So there's lots of uh, offline activities going on, but al at the same time, this is also possible because there is lots of online activity and coordination that goes online. So people in the streets eventually use those technologies to say, hey, we are here in the streets of Barcelona, but we are also in your Facebook uh, timeline in your Twitter feed, uh, so that we are local, because we are here, but at the same time we are global, because we can be anywhere. And that's something that I think that 21st century activism uh, is different from, from previous centuries. This, this use of blended spaces, both offline and online, to convey different voices. Thank you. Um, and it all happens because of the internet, right? This is the internet in 1961, the year I was born actually, and it was just a, a connection between four uh, places in the US. Uh, uh, the first connections that were made between uh, uh, research centers in, in the US. But if you look at the internet more than 40 years or now, it looks radically different. It looks like a human brain uh, with many, many nodes that connect uh, areas from across the world in a, in a quite organized way. It's, there is no chaos here. There's, there is some distributed network where some centers are more important than others, but there is no centrality, right? There's a distribution of, of nodes, some still more important than others. And that's how the internet looks like or is a, a nice representation of it in 40 years after these first connections. What I'm saying all this, because this is the first trilemma I want, well, the, the trilemma I want to address that needs to be framed, I think, under this internet background. So this is not mine, the trilemma is by one of the leading theorists of deliberation, James Fiskin. And, and when he was reflecting on, on uh, the best way to, to embrace a constitutional reform, so one of the most important things politically speaking, a country can, can engage in, how, how he was uh, thinking of bringing deliberation into the process to make it more democratic. And he came to that conclusion that you may have three 
core principles uh, in, in a democratic reform process. And we, we may agree on different demo models of democracy, but we, we can consider that political equality, deliberation, and mass participation are key components in a process of, of democratic reform, in a constitutional reform, a democratic reform. The problem is that when you try to fulfill these three principles simultaneously, the dilemma arises. And why? Let's consider that with uh, more detail. <coughs> you may have a process where you have political equality and mass participation. And that could be the case of a, of a voting, of a referendum, for instance. Right? But you would miss in this process the liberation because the, the, the incentives for, for people to get informed, to participate, are low. It's kind of an audience democracy, some, some uh, researchers would say. So you miss the deliberation component. Then you can organize processes where you have political equality, yes, and deliberation. And that would be what other authors call mini-publics. You, you may have citizen assemblies, you may have uh, um, deliberation, small deliberation assemblies that uh, are composed by lots. Um, by, by some sort of sortition of, of uh, representation. So then you have, yes, you have the deliberation component to the picture, and you, you may claim that you have political equality because that, that mini public somehow represents the voices of, of the broader population, but you will miss mass participation because statistical representation is not political representation, and some people will say, well, I didn't take part in that process. Uh, my decision was not taken into account. Uh, so to solve that, we could think of processes that include both deliberation and mass participation. And I'll be talking about this in a second. The example, the constitutional crowdsourcing of, of the uh, constitution in Iceland. Uh, one of the first examples of using social media, and notably Facebook, to crowdsource ideas from, from, from citizens on how this uh, constitution should be amended, or actually in, in the Icelandic case, how the new constitution should, be, should look like. Uh, but again, um, you may have mass participation here because you have access to social media. Uh, you have deliberation uh, to some extent because you can use those platforms for, for online deliberation but you will be missing political equality because in, a, in social media, uh, in this type of platforms, uh, people may, uh, will, self, will be self-selecting, so will not be reaching the entire population. And that's Fishkin trilemma, right? So again, you can try to aspire to the three principles, but not simultaneously. So you need to look for proxies. And his proxies are like, well, let's have deliberative polls, uh, which is a very specific process he designed for constitutional uh, reform, uh, but it's based on, 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 yeah, on uh, sortition of uh, very sophisticated processes to extract uh, a mini public. Another option would be, well, let's have those principles fulfilled, but not simultaneously, but one after the other. So let's have first a, conven a constitutional convention, followed by some mini publics, and, and then uh, completed with a referendum. But the examples uh, that we've got about this, one being again the constitution in Iceland and the other probably, as Fiskin mentions, uh, the, the, uh, the referendum for republic in, in Australia uh, were not so successful of, uh, about following these steps. And the, the reason being that deliberation do not does not travel well across those different steps. So, so you may have um, um, many publics that uh, debate on, uh, on certain issues and then reach some decisions, but then you have a referendum and those decisions are not uh, imported from, from, that, from that other step. So it's, it's tricky. So the, the, the trilemma remains uh, and, and our, our interest was whether civic technologies could help to mitigate, not resolve, but some, somehow to mitigate these and other similar trilemmas that we could be discussing. So basically, by, by civic technologies, I, I mean 
technologies that leverage crowdsourcing for civic engagement and participation. And there's been an explosion of those technologies in the last few years. Um, just an, as an example, uh, you may know, may be aware of change.org or uh, other constitutional platforms. You have here the example of, of using Facebook for, for the cons crowdsourcing of uh, the Islandic constitution. Uh, so we have a, 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 a very broad um, set of, of uh, civic technologies that, that uh, movements are using, uh, again, for blended purposes, offline and online mobilization. So I, I, we tried to figure out, uh, this, by the way, these are examples of the countries today that have attempted somehow to, to begin a, a process of constitutional reform or, or constitution making from scratch by using this kind of technologies, by using social media, by, by using crowdsourcing techniques to reach to a, a broadest range of population to collect input on how this constitution should look like. Uh, the examples are very varied and we can talk later maybe um, with different degrees of, of success. And uh, so that's, that's the thing. Uh, how, how to organize these, these uh, uh, dozens if not hundreds of new technologies, platforms, tools that are emerging um, to enhance the way we deliberate online, the way we, we um, participate uh, in, in political affairs. Uh, so this is one proposal. Uh, it's, it's to m match those technologies against different models of democracy, classical models of democracy. And it's by no means an exhaustive classification because there are much more tools out there that could be um, introduced. So the criteria for being in this list was, well, let's first consider those tools who, who apply some sort of crowdsourcing who collect input from, from a broad uh, number of, of citizens, uh, and then uh, which are grassroots, which, which are not uh, consultation platforms from, from governments, right? Who, uh, for instance, South Australia has a very good consultation platform called USA. It's not included here because we were thinking more of grassroots initiatives from foundations, from, from startups, from, from citizens that uh, who simply organize. So tools could be classified in tools that uh, where the predominant functionalities provide access to information uh, as a prerequisite for voting. So the more informed you are about your candidates, uh, the, the more informed you, you, your vote can be. Uh, and that, that belongs to a liberal tradition where citizens were basically uh, requested to be informed in order to cast votes. Uh, there are other apps who focus on precisely on, on that, on, on the voting aspect and, and provide functionalities for, for voting online. Then you have uh, another set of tools that focus on, on monitoring, uh, monitoring representatives in parliament, monitoring governments, um, monitoring your mayors uh, that require a more active role uh, from a citizen, not just being informed and voting, but also monitoring the political activity of the representatives, for example. And that belongs to a more civic and republican model of democracy. And then you have another set of tools, um, recent tools that, that require a more engaged citizen. So not just monitoring, but also to provide some proactive uh, uh, input to the polity um, by, again, either at the local, at the state, at the federal level. And these are tools that, uh, that ask you to sign petitions, that ask you to report uh, incidents in your, in your local council, uh, things that want you to improve uh, how things are working at different levels. And finally, and, and uh, this is the, perhaps the newest generation of tools, and I consider my vote you were talking about them, uh, my vote probably in the next uh, talk, there, tools that, that, that frame all these processes into broader uh, considerations on, uh, on deliberating and designing uh, political systems. Um, 
I, I fit them into the, into the new deliberative and epistemic models of, of democracy. So these are tools that really take seriously um, how to deliver it at a, at a large scale, how to provide input, how, on, uh, how to design, uh, not just uh, collect ideas, but how to design systems, political systems, uh, to improve the ones we, we currently have. So it's, as you can see, it's work in process. Uh, um, it, it, it will take a few years. We are applying for, for funding to, to develop um, those, those, those uh, not just classifications, but, but in-depth analysis of, of what's going on. I don't want to reduce everything to technology because uh, what, what, what we denominate linked democracy is actually uh, the interaction between those technologies but, but people behind those technologies. So the most important thing here is, is people using those technologies, leveraging uh, data, open data, which is another trend that you probably have heard about it in, in previous sessions. So it's the interaction between these three components uh, that, that makes a, a, a political ecosystem thriving. So, so if we reduce everything to, uh, to the technology component, we will we'll be missing most part of the picture. So, so linked democracy would be this interaction, right, between technologies, people, uh, groups, uh, and, and, and the data they can leverage. So to here, uh, I would stop here, but, but that's, the, that's the new part I wanted uh, uh, to add, if I have time to, which is a couple of caveats. The first caveat is the way we can, uh, we can have our data compromised. I'm sure you, you are aware of these, these companies, Cambridge Analytica uh, or Google DeepMind, uh, that precisely what they do is, is, is to mine uh, large uh, amounts of, of people's data uh, for, for uh, profiling, for, for, um, for organizing uh, propaganda campaigns, computational propaganda campaigns, for uh, flooding the political debate online with um, automated agents. So this is something that needs to be taken into account. I'm just gonna, just a second, uh, I'm just gonna show 50 seconds of, of a video by one of the Cambridge Analytica researchers uh, where he explains very briefly what, what the Cambridge Analytica approach has been has consisted of uh, for the past elections, right? This would summarize what he says. So today in the United States, we have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every individual. Four or 5,000 data points for every individual. So we model the personality of every adult across the United States, some 2,030 million people. Where these data points come from? basically from whatever you like on Facebook, whatever you share on Facebook, the ads you click on, everything you do online is tracked by companies such as Cambridge Analytica, uh, so that they can micro-profile people, um, uh, create categories of, of voters, and then target those, those different groups of people with different information uh, contents. Could be fake news, could be to make you believe that the Pope agreed to support Trump, could be misleading information, not necessarily false, but, but misleading in, in, the, in the sense that it compares things that are not really commensurable, something, uh, things like that. Um, this is the first caveat. The second caveat, uh, and it, this stems out of, of uh, previous presentations where this component was missing, was the second caveat is power. Uh, so, and this is an example that uh, I'm taking from the recent shutdown of uh, pro-referendum websites in, in Catalonia. So you may have a, a thriving ecosystem where people use data, use, use the internet to promote their ideas, but then you have the state uh, which, which, uh, which has uh, the judicial power with, uh, with him, which has different tools to block uh, this information and should basically shut down the, the internet, uh, censors, censors the, the contents uh, it doesn't like. So how, how do we deal with, with power, the power of the states? 
versus the capacity of individuals to organize online, to promote their ideas, to support their campaigns, etc., etc. The state is, is there, the state is all, and the state will colonize the internet as it will colonize the blockchain, probably, so that the, the old questions of power remain very, very uh, present. Um, just not to finish up with, with negative notes. So, so we, when this happened a couple of weeks ago, when, when the, the Spanish government decided to block pro-referendum websites uh, um, using the, the judiciary, uh, and then, and then uh, seizing ballot boxes, which eventually couldn't, couldn't manage to do, but seizing paper, uh, paper um, for, for the elections. So there were some, some, um, some responses on the internet. One of these responses was by Peter Sand, the co-founder of the Pirate Bay. Basically, he offered uh, his new services to host the, the electoral role. So eventually, if the Catalan referendum uh, took place was because the, the electoral role was hosted in one of those um, uh, servers, uh, obviously outside Spain. Uh, and and he, one of his reflections is, with social media pressuring us to be less anonymous and services being centralized, we need alternatives. The alternatives, basically, are decentralization of the web and then uh, the adoption of, of new technologies that are privacy friendly, that, uh, that protect individuals, that not, do not expose themselves to, to, the, to the openness of social, of social media. So, so the response has been interesting. The, as I said, the, the electoral role was eventually secured uh, with all the privacy requirements in one of the, one of the external uh, servers. And, and what about the, blo uh, the websites that were blocked by the, by the Catalan government? Well, they reopened um, under new names, new, new domain names, using this technology, the Interplanetary File System, which is a technology, an open source technology, that mirrors the, uh, uh, the blockchain, uh, so that uh, a new myriad of, of web pro-referendum websites were emerging on the internet just under different domain names. And finally, on, the, on, the, on referendum day, again, uh, uh, an army of, of uh, volunteer um, computer scientists came to the rescue in, in, in making sure that people had access to information uh, by providing uh, tips, recommendations on how to use the internet safely, and how to communicate safe, safely. And eventually, it, it, it all boils down to ethical de decisions by, by people. For instance, whether to open your Wi-Fi at home for other people to get access to the internet or, or not. So I will end with, a, with an interesting paradox that I, need. I think it's good for discussion. So we, we've, we realize that the, the new generation, the 21st activism, will, use, will be using social media, but more, uh, more importantly, we'll start be using privacy-friendly tools, um, tools that promote decentralization, but at the same time, tools that uh, make our networks more secure um, and more resistant to, to, to central powers. Uh, so it, it will be using cryptography and, and sec secure networks. But at the same time, I think that the more these uh, crypto tools are used, uh, the more open, transparent, uh, and, 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 and open these, these, these political movements will need to be. So we will be facing new tensions between crypto and, uh, and secure and protected networks, and at the same time, the need for more uh, transparency and, and, and ethical activism. And thank you very much for your attention.